Hello, everyone. Carol is about to show up. Two more minutes. Good morning. I see Howard Gentry. Howard, delighted to see you this morning. It's always nice when the program is here before I'm here. <laughs> oh, I know. I'm not. So Jim Schulman is having trouble getting on. Did okay. you email him? Pardon? When Jim Schulman is having trouble getting on, uh, did he get an email? He did. It it was on. It wasn't an email. He got it on his phone. Okay, well, let me see if I can't. Hmm. Um, I, I sent him. I didn't send him what I have right here. Um, hmm. Let's see how I can do this. Forward. You need to undo it. You put it through for some reason. Forward. I don't know. It's fascinating. <laughs> There you go. See? Um, maybe it would have gone. Yeah, okay. Okay. Thank you, Howard. Uh, I didn't see a message from him, but he may have. No, he, he, sent, he sent it to me, and I sent him something, but I sent him the one that um, where everybody could come on, but let me call him right quick and let him know what I've done. I actually sent him my, um, I forwarded him my- um, <laughs> URL? My calendar. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Jim. Yeah. I just forwarded you my calendar, um, uh, um, you know, request, and it'll have the URL on there. I think it's, let's see if it works. Did you get it? Meeting registration, join meeting in progress. No, 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 no. My cal Yeah, All that's right. great. It's a calendar invite. Go look on your email. I'll go back. When you send it to the to, uh, uh, vice mayor. Back. I'll send to the vice mayor uh, one. And, uh, okay. Calendar invite. If you just click on it, that'll be easier. But you're on your phone. Well, you can still do it on your phone. I think I can. Well, it's not giving me the link. Did you get Did you get a calendar invite? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And you open it up. Yeah. Yeah. I accepted it. Okay, it won't give me the link. Hmm. Okay. I got one more way to do it. I don't know why. Oh, let me see. Let me see. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Let me see. Let me see. Right. Okay, I'm going to copy it. I'm going to copy it. And then I'm going to email it to you. Just to, I got to email it because. I don't have, uh, can't do it on my phone. So let me send it to you. Okay. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Email. All right. While he's getting connected, um, I think there's some announcements that need to be made. You want to go on and make the announcements. So when we get Jim on, we're ready to go. Yeah, and that would work. I want to welcome everyone. Thank you very much for showing up on this rainy Friday morning um, yeah, or right afternoon, now. depending upon what it is. I uh, wanted to also make uh, just a couple of announcements other than just welcoming people. There's a lot going on in the next month, uh, and we want you to be sure that you're uh, focused on what uh, is going on. First of all, <clears throat> our membership renewal um, effort will start in May. This effort is for all those who had renewed from January 1st, 2021 through G December 31st, 
2021. So if you renewed last year, in other words, it's time to start renewing again this year. You'll be getting information about this in uh, hopefully so, uh, through your email and you'll respond right away. And then we won't have to den you a lot of times with postcards and letters saying, please uh, renew your membership. Uh, Reba Holmes is our membership director and she does a fantastic job and she will be in touch with you. Uh, also, I wanted you to know that tomorrow, even if you have not registered, you've still got time, is the annual spring council open to all League of Women Voters me members. This is, a, this is a, the, the League of Women Voters Tennessee Spring Council, and, um, and you can register at League of Women Voters Tennessee, lwvtn.org website, and they they will be happy to see you. Third, I want to remind you, if you haven't uh, registered yet, for the June 5th Nashville League annual meeting at the Nashville Public Library on June 5th, 2.30 to 4.30, parking is available at the library site. We are very excited that we're going to get together for the first time in person since 2020. So this is our big event. We're celebrating with punch cookies, a business meeting, presentation of the Molly Todd Award, and a per, uh, a private viewing of the votes for women room at the, at the public library. So please register so we know how many cookies you want to eat. And we'll <laughs> see you then. And finally, just to let you know, there is a League of Women Voters United States convention taking place between June 23rd and June 26th in Denver in person, but there is also a virtual option. And if you would be interested in doing that, the, you can go to convention.lwb. Dot org. I'll put that in uh, the chat so you can look at it and see there is a cost involved even for the virtual, but uh, there is also um, some help possible through uh, a grant given uh, or some available money given through the through the League of Women Voters US. Marion Ott has sent out some information about that. And if you're interested in in that helping with registration, uh, get in touch with me. I'll put in my email as well. So uh, with that, and I think I see Jim is on and I'll turn it back over to Carol. Take care, have a great month. Thank you so much, Madeline. Uh, Jim, my apologies if I didn't connect with you properly, but I'm really glad that you're on and I'm looking so forward to all that you have to say. But let me first do kind of a general introduction about where we're going today. Um, restoration of voting rights is at the heart of our democracy here in Tennessee, and that is the right to vote. More than 400,000 Tennesseans with past felony convictions cannot vote. They are barred from voting. And they represent one in 12 adults in Tennessee. Tennessee laws for voters registration are some of the most restrictive in the entire United States. And this is reflected in the fact that less than 4% of our eligible individuals have had their voting rights restored as of four years ago. Many who are disenfranchised don't even know that they can restore voting rights or the options for doing so. And most Tennesseans are not even aware of these problems. We believe, the League of Women Voters believes that restoring voting rights must be addressed with three goals in mind, education, outreach, and advocacy. Together, we can help make democracy work for all Tennesseans, and we need everybody's support in making this happen. Our speakers today are going to address this issue from their perspectives, and they are both very involved in um, restoring voting rights here in Davidson County. And let me introduce both of them. We're really lucky. We have got two guys, one who is presently vice mayor, one who used to be vice mayor, Jim <coughs> 
excuse me, Jim Schulman is presently vice mayor, and he also um, and is also CEO of Safe Haven, a shelter for homeless families. He's a homeless advocate of good standing and has long been involved in social justice issues. He also happens to be attorney and uh, once upon a time, I do believe he was my councilman, but that's been a while. Howard Gentry uh, recently has been reelected to the criminal court clerk position and congratulations Howard to you for that. He is a former vice mayor, former councilman, and long known for his ability to get into good trouble from the time he was a teenager on. He's a native Nashvilleian, an advocate for the poor, and a strong believer in racial parity and other civil rights issues, but he also strongly believes that we have got to restore the rights of citizens to vote in this community. So with no further announcement, fellas, Let's hear what you got to say. <laughs> well, I guess uh, I should let the current vice mayor go first, or is it, is it age before uh, you? I don't I, I don't know what it is, but I'm sitting in your chair, Howard. You're all <laughs> I, I, I guess you're the vice mayor then today. Well, so I think this program got started. Howard and I actually cheated, and we talked yesterday, but. <clears throat> I've been doing uh, community mm -hmm. conversations. I started this um, right around, I guess, around April, right after the pandemic started in 2020. We were, um, uh, Joyce McDaniel, who is a, a friend of mine who helps me with um, uh, being vice mayor, um, had said, you know, while people are at home, maybe we should talk about issues that are relevant. And I said, okay, I'm not doing anything on Saturday mornings. And so we started these conversations and we, we've done them for about two years. We took April off this, this past month. But one of the conversations was with Howard Gentry as the criminal court clerk. <laughs> and uh, the conversation <laughs> kind of morphed into a, a really very strong conversation about restoring voter rights. And it was one of the better programs. Uh, Howard, longtime friend, very knowledgeable about this. Uh, a lot more knowledgeable than I am. Uh, a lot of the stuff I look up, uh, I look up and try to figure out how all this stuff works. So when Howard and I talked yesterday, we thought we would just kind of continue that type of conversation about things that we, about how you restore voting rights and what does that mean for people and why is it, why has it been more difficult? What steps are we taking to make it easier? That type of thing. And, um, so, Howard, if you're game, that's what we're going to try to do. Is that all right? That's fine. And I hope that's OK with everybody. But uh, it worked so well on his uh, show. We just thought we'd go back with it again. But before um, we start here, I want to, uh, you know, I think that everybody on the line knows that we all have a role in this or could have a role in this if we chose. and you might say, well, what does the vice mayor have to do with it? What does the Metro Council have to do with it? Well, as we get to talking, you'll see they have a whole lot to do with it because uh, uh, when it comes to fines and fees and, and, um, and different uh, um, policies that are in place, uh, a lot of people can't get their voting rights back unless those policies are uh, in line with their having the ability and they're not uh, uh, keeping them from being able to move forward in the process and, and, and in his other profession or in his, I guess in his real profession, uh, you know, Jim actually deals with people who ha have those needs all the time because you find out with the homeless that, uh, and a lot of it is uh, by virtue of their circumstances, uh, they have, uh, criminal records um, and, and it's going to get a little worse on them and thank God that Safe Haven is providing housing and shelter for uh, the homeless because now it's getting ready to be a felony to uh, camp on um, um, uh, parks and, and state property and, and private property, public property. So uh, it, it's getting ready to be worse. And so <laughs> he has a whole lot to do with this um, on in, in, in many ways. But um, 
we are one of the worst states. Uh, you know, somebody asked me one day, why can't you just say hard as snow? It's one of the worst states in the nation when it comes to people who have uh, felonies or committed, who have lost their voting rights to be able to have their voting rights restored. And, and uh, it's, uh, it starts at the legislative uh, uh, body because they create the laws and it filters down to our counties because we have to follow the laws. And so uh, the fact is you say, well, how do, does the state make it worse? It's just the laws that we have um, the, and, the, and the process that we have. And so it used to be in Nashville that a person who had, or in every county still that way really, uh, that has a felony if they uh, were released from prison, they would first have to go to pardons and parole to uh, determine what charges are holding their voting rights. Then they will have to come to my office to uh, uh, deal with the cost factors. And then they would have to go back to pardons and paroles to uh, show that um, we have signed off on their uh, fees and fines that they have been taken care of. And then once that is determined, then they will have to go to the election commission and apply for uh, a voter or register to vote. And in that process, the election commission then has to send the information back to the state to have everything verified. And then the person will then get their voter registration or they won't. And I mean, come on, you just got out of prison. You just got out of jail and you probably don't have a car. You don't, you, you know, you're trying to live, you're trying to be free again. And the last thing you want to do is to bounce back and forth. The last thing you want to do is come back in the courthouse. Uh, the, and, and then you don't have any money. So you can't pay the fines and fees and, and so are the fees that are associated with the um, with what is holding your voting rights or, or your ability to receive your voting rights. So uh, we have a lot of states that once you walk out of the, uh, the prison, your, your voting rights are restored. And a lot of states that uh, do not require so much uh, complication in doing it. Uh, we just happen to be one of those states that do. Well, Howard, let me ask you a question about that. <clears throat> I'm, I'm sitting here looking at the Secretary of State's website, mm -hmm. and it's got a, a basic form saying if you had had a felony conviction, uh, your eligibility to register and vote depends on the crime you were, you committed, convicted, were convicted of and the date of your conviction. So there's like a, a sheet that says, look, if you, could, if you were convicted on or after May 18th, 1981, and you did one of these things, you might or might not get your, your uh, voter registration back. Mm -hmm. It's a fairly complicated list. So, you know, when you talk about the sense that uh, you got enough issues going on anyway, and I know what you're getting to because people are gonna have to go back and forth to different places to get certain things. How do people know whether they're eligible to get it back in the first place? Well, the fact is that they don't. And because there's nobody telling them that when they walk out the door. So they have to be proactive themselves because there's no agency. Um, I won't say there's no agency because if they, if they happen to land into a uh, project return or, or, or different um, uh, agencies that uh, uh, work with um, uh, felons, uh, then they will have the information, but that information still doesn't slow the process or make it any easier. They will be able to tell them, but the average person does not land in one of those locations. They don't, they, they, they might go to a halfway house and then they're out on the street looking for jobs, looking for work. And um, they might be lucky enough to find job or find work, but uh, they'll never feel like a, a, a United States citizen if people tell them, well, you can work, you can pay your taxes, but you can't vote. 
Well, so let me ask you this, and you may or may not know this because I don't know, but um, if if we're really interested in um, particularly um, when people get out of um, a facility, do you do we know that is there a, a packet of information with resources that are given to individuals that says, look, you know, um, uh, resources, you know, if you if you need to go, if you're looking for work, this is a place to go. Project return. Uh, that's a maybe a place that you can call. If you, you know, if you're looking for help in a different way, this is a place to call. These are things that you should know as you as you come out of the facility. And one is you may be eligible to have your voting registration restored. But do we, do we know that or is it more of kind of people just hearing about it and then having to figure it out on their own? Well, I would, I would say, I can't tell you that they do or they don't. I would hope that they at least do that much. And, and I would, I would err on the side of saying that they do at least tell them uh, that these places are available to them. But I would also suggest based on the interactions I've had over over the years with people who have been in that situation there's nobody guiding them through their process and and uh, that is the i think that's the crime that that's the and that's the piece that is missing and so the fact is that well it's the same way and we're not gonna we're not gonna go uh that far right now but it's the same way with expungements. I mean, people, they know that you can get your record expunged, but they don't know how, they don't know what, they don't know who and, and those things, and there's nobody telling them. But let's just go, oh, you're going to ask me a question? No, I was just going to, I think maybe we're doing the same way. Let's just go back to the basic and go, all right, take me. I, I have, I committed a felony and um, I'm not sure if I'm on that list or not, where I can have my voter rights restored. Um, and I hear that it's a possibility. So walk me through what, if I, if someone said, you know what, that, that Howard Gentry guy is a good guy. You should go to his office. Tell me what, you know, and I, I find your office. What, what are your, um, the folks in your office going to tell me when I walk in the door, if I have no clue and I'm going like, you know what, I, I did my time. I'm out. I'm working. I, I'd like to vote. I really want to do that. But how do, how do you help me restore that? Right. I'm going to tell you how it was. Okay. And then I'm going to tell you how it is okay. because we Sounds have good. created a different process. Right. How it used to be was you walk in my office and if you do not have any literature or any paperwork from pardons and paroles, I'm going to send you to pardons and paroles. And then what you're going to do, you're going to sit there until they wait on you. And then they will actually um, give you a form that tells you what cases or case is holding your voting rights. You can you can be charged with five different things, but it might only be one thing that keeps you from having your voting rights. Mm -hmm. And then what they're going to do is tell you, you need to come back to me and I need to fill out section four. And that is, are the fines and the fees paid? That's a yes or a no. Okay. Um, let me, let me stop you for just a second, mm -hmm. uh, just to make sure everybody understands. I, again, we're talking about the older process. Pardons and paroles is not in your office. They have no, to go someplace it's else. State, it's a state yeah. uh, office, and it's down. It's down downtown, and I forgot what building, but it's a state office. And and then when they come back to us, then we determine first: Do you have the money? If they do, they pay us, and then we check off box four, and then they uh, have to take it back to. Uh, pardons and parole and then they process it and then um, and then they have to come back to me and we send them to the election commission with that information all right so All that's right. three 
That's it's, three visits already to you. Yeah. But you still feel some more because if they owe money and they're indigent, then we can set them a court date. So then they have to leave, come back to the courts on that court date, and the judge will determine whether they can waive the fee or fine, the, the, the court costs or not. If they are able to waive the court costs, then they will have it waived, come back to our office again, and we will sign off on it and they go back to pardons and parole. If they will not do the fines and fees, I mean, the, the court costs, then they have to come up with it. We can put them on a payment plan or they have to come up with it. And right, how, it's how, just, how much are we how much are we talking about in terms of those fines? And well, fees? it could be anywhere from one hundred fifty dollars to uh, I mean, we got felonies, so it could be ten thousand dollars. It, it, it's so many, you know, if they've sat in jail and we're going to talk about that, too. In the past, they've got jail fees, forty one dollars a day. And 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 if they sat in jail for a, a month, you know what that can add up. So it could be enormous. Or it can be $150, but uh, the majority of them are coming out of prison. So that means they have all kinds of fines and fees and costs. And so they're, they're huge. And so, um, uh, and, and I'm seeing these questions and we're going to mm -hmm. get to this. And so that's been the process, but I'm going to go on to the new process and, and we have created it. We're the only county doing it. Nobody has to do it. We've created it and it's working for us. So now you could get out of jail and they say, Howard Gentry is a good guy. Give him a call. Okay. So I come to your office. New no. process. Okay. Oh, I don't Let's even say, have to process. Okay. You don't even have to come. Let's say that you do come though. You come to my office and what we're going to do is we're going to start that form for you because we have the same form that pardon and paroles has. And we're going to email that form to pardon and paroles. And we're going to, matter of fact, let me stop. You're going to come to the office. You're going to show me your ID. You're going to, we're going to pull you up in our system. We're going to see what you need to do. <clears throat> we're going to tell you to go home. Okay. You're going to sign the paperwork. And then you're going to go home. We're going to send it to pardon and paroles. They're going to send back to us through email uh, what case it is that is holding your voting rights back. We will then research that case to determine if there is a cost. If there is a cost, we're going to call you and say, hey, you, got, you owe $1,500. Do you have it? They're going to, if they say yes, then we're going to say, okay you need to come back to the office and pay it. If they say no, then we're gonna give them a court date over the phone. They don't need a lawyer, a court date with, uh, with the, the judge, normally the judge that, um, that uh, gave them the uh, charge if they're still in office. And they have to go before the judge. If the judge waives the fee, that person comes right downstairs and gives us the uh, paper that they get in the courtroom that says the fee is waived. We thank them for that paper. We fat, we email that form back to the uh, to the uh, pardons and paroles. Pardon and parole clears them. Then we also get that person, I'm sorry, while they're with us to fill out their voting registration forms, okay. sign them. Once we get pardon and paroles email back, then we send a packet to the election commission with the all the forms signed. The election commission has to send it over to the state just to verify they don't have any cases in other counties or anything. And once they clear that, they mail that person their um, their voter registration voter card. Registration card. Yeah. If they do not, let's say you call me, and you don't owe any money, or or you can pay the money, we can actually take your payment over the phone. 
you never have to step foot in here except to sign your voter information. You either sign it here or you go to the um, out to the voter, I mean the election commission. But right. that's one stop. So so we have we have streamlined it either to one stop or to the courtroom making it two stops. Let, let me ask you I mean. let me ask you a, a question that I don't think I asked you last time that um, is is bugging me. <laughs> that is um, we're making people pay these costs and fees to get the chance after they've served their time to yeah. get their voter reg the, to get their voting rights back. Yeah. And why is, are we unique in that, in the sense of, um, we're, we're not the only state that does it, but there are a lot of states that don't. I mean, once you've paid your, these are not fines. These are not, these are, these are court costs and fees, whether well, they're fines, but this is not a uh, restitution. This, these are just the cost of being in the system. But once you do your time and pay your debt to society, you should be able to walk away with a zero balance. I mean, you, right. you so, paid it. So this but is, I mean, so obviously we don't do that here in Tennessee and know. people, I mean, they may owe thousands of dollars of costs that they can't pay. And then they have to, and then the process is, okay, let me ask you another question. All right, so uh, we're talking about a, a, you know, much more complicated process before than it is now. But, um, okay, so I, I'm going through this process. I owe $3,000 in some types of court costs. Um, and I wanna have my voting rights restored. So I make an appointment, I'm sent to court to see if I can have those, I guess, waived. Declared an yeah. incident, whatever it is. What, what's the process? So what we do is either over the phone or when they come into our office, we have a compliance office. And they go over there and we help them fill out their forms to determine indigency. The judges okay. have allowed us to assist in doing that. It used to be done solely by the judges. As a matter of fact, the judge is the only one that can, can actually do the final determination. But they trust that we are providing them information that they need to be able to make that determination. You should not have that. And uh, the, the, the public defender's office used to do it, but our office didn't. So we have them fill out the form and, and we actually have a person out of our office in the courtroom when um, the hearings take place. And uh, the judges determine whether that three thousand uh, dollars, whether that person has the ability to pay, or whether uh, that three thousand dollars is even necessary to pay, because before the council did away with jail fees, um, the judges would. I mean, now that you all have done that, the judges usually just wipe the jail fees out, because most of the people that went to prison went to jail first because they were transferred from jail to prison until their cases were um, dissolved, then they had to stay in jail. So, um, man, you know, I, it, it's almost a criminal act in itself. It's unconstitutional to me to for a person to be persecuted based on court costs, fines, and fees. It's, it's or, or uh, All right. First, so, yes. So let me ask you another question that we may or may not know that we didn't talk about last time. As, do you know of anybody who has prosecuted this case? Because I, I agree with you. Um, it, it's people. Yeah, it seems almost yeah. unconstitutional to be able to take away in this country somebody's voting rights. You, you take them away. Okay, I get that. But when they get when they, they have served their time and they're back out, those rights should be restored. But it sounds like at least in, in Davidson County, you, your office has come up with a, a much better way of getting people through the process. But that's, it's a whole not, lot that's, better. Not, that's not everywhere. It, it, the whole lot, it's a whole lot better. But the state, um, I have to give them credit. 
the state pardons and parole, they were a little slow to come on board at first, but they see the value. So they're set up for it. So any county can do it. And of course, the election commission, the big, the big problem was that everybody was thinking you had to have that person to sign the paperwork right there in, in, in their face. The only time you have to sign that paperwork uh, in, is that the election commission, I mean, the papers that go to election commission uh, in your presence. As long as I have the original copies and I have it in file because I'm the criminal court clerk and that's my job, then nobody else, the pardons of parole doesn't have to have an original copy. They just need to know it was signed because I'm the keeper of the records. And the election commission, they don't care about those other papers. All they care about is them signing uh, the, and you know, we go out and get people registered to vote all the time and bring the yeah. paperwork to the election commission. So anyway, but the fact is that, yeah, the ACLU and others are, other organizations have always been fighting this, but uh, unfortunately the law only addresses uh, uh, persons that are being jailed or detained in a jail that you cannot, uh, uh, you cannot uh, incarcerate someone uh, because of their inability to pay. They should not be incarcerated. It doesn't speak to uh, getting the voting rights back. So, All right. Yeah. So there's a, a lot of questions coming up about the jail fees and the court fees and prison fees. Um, it, as I understand it, uh, if you if you're incarcerated in a, like a local jail, there may be there, there are fees that are associated with that or Used to be. Uh, okay. Used to be. Used to be here in Dallas. $41 a day, but you all, yeah. <clears throat> you all voted. That was a, we could do that, that at a, the Metro. Level. That was a there Metro County initiative that they took care yeah. of that, right? There okay. are other fines and fees that you all also <clears throat> uh, had the authority at the local level to, to uh, do away with, and you did. And it used to be that a felon, to be able to get their records, say, expunged, <laughs> Uh, it used to cost them $450. The legislature did reduce it to $350, then they reduced it to $150. And now what they have done is they created a new bill that said that the clerks, uh, they, they reduced it to $100 and said that the clerks had the authority to determine whether they would charge it or not. But in their, what do you call that, uh, the, the financial, what's the, part when you have a bill they the the, 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 the the something impact the financial impact statement or whatever in okay. in the bill they stated that surely no uh clerk's office would um would choose to not charge the fee well yeah that would have been uh, mary and uh, said it's a, it's a fiscal note on the bill it's fiscal a fiscal note that's it i called the mayor and told them that we would no longer charge the fee so there is no expungement uh, fee anymore for felonies. Okay, so what you're doing, Howard, uh, in your office is very, very good. So uh, you you have you all are working through this, figuring out a way to make the process so much easier. You've worked with the council, worked with the mayor, figured out ways to get those fees down if the fees can make completely go away. Um, so my question is, what about, I mean, have you had discussions with other counties around us to say, this is what we're doing. we have, we have never. They don't want to do it because their fees, they, they, that's how they build their jails and courthouses. <laughs> and, and, and so they're actually um, paying for the criminal justice uh, system on the backs of uh, poor people and people that have already uh, served their time. Fortunately, the big four, Memphis, Knoxville, Chattanooga, and Nashville, uh, our budgets are not tied to uh, those fines and fees in the same ways. And, uh, but we're the only county doing it. Memphis is looking at it, but uh, we're the only county in the state doing it. And I'm not a very popular clerk among my association of 986, 97 counties, but I don't care. And, um, uh, the fact is, this is this is the cost of doing business fairly and 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 properly, and and so you know. Uh, but fortunately, 
as long as pardoning paroles is okay with it. And we're acting within the law. I mean, the right. law doesn't say we can't do it. The law says the person can get their voting rights back. It's just so convoluted and 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 so difficult that they that they either can't start or they get frustrated uh, in the process. And so since 2019, it took us a few couple years to really get this thing fired up. But since 2019, we have restored over uh, close to around 3,000 um, uh, voters' rights. And it doesn't matter what county you live in, we can restore voting rights if you live in Macon County. It doesn't matter. Hartman, it doesn't matter as long as they're Tennessee residents. Um, but it's even growing now because we've already uh, restored or helped to restore 500 people since November. So I was going to ask, because it seems, um, it, it seems very unfair uh, for in the in the state process for someone let's say so i'm originally from johnson city which is east tennessee so washington yeah. county so um you know that's uh, i commit a felony get out of uh, jail end up in back in washington county and want my voters voting rights restored the process there is going to be as complicated as the process you first talked about yes uh, and it may be that much more expensive. It may be I have the fees that I got to pay in order to get that those rights back. They, they're not, they don't them. have to waive them. They don't have right. to waive. Them. Right. But but if I if I make a phone call or if I need to get in the car and drive down to Davidson County, yes, there's a much easier process, and I may right. have even through the court system, I may have the ability to get my fees waived. That's gonna yeah. We have to work with the clerk in that county. But okay, and they, what is, how does how does that work? Because Washington County is going to go. We, we I want the money. We yeah, call and what do they want? And the clerk says, "Well, we don't. We're not going to waive the fees." Then we tell the person, "You're going to have to pay it because we can't help them. They can't come into our court." But we have had some people that, um, I mean, everybody has a right to file for indigency, and it's going to take a very harsh judge a lot of times the clerks in those counties make those decisions but if that person shows that they do not have any form of income if they're disabled or, or have an illness or what have you uh, a lot of the counties will uh, waive fees. it's not that they don't it's just that um, they're, they're, they're not quick to do it and the majority of them, you're going to have to really show some evidence of something really dire to get your fees away. And uh, but but dire doesn't always look dire. You know, if a person is making eight dollars an hour working at McDonald's and and has two kids and an apartment and a car and and has to buy food, medicine and everything else, and they're the only provider. Uh, that's dire if you owe $3,000 to a court. And so you can't just tell a person just because you have a job that you can pay this. And at the end of the day, what's going to be better for that person? Because when you have restored those voting rights, what you've also done is put them in a position to be a more productive citizen just all the way around. So what's better to have that person made whole and being a, a, a tax paying a productive citizen that can better raise their family and, and just feel like um, um, they're, they're, um, they are a better person or to just hold them down and, 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 and keep a weight on their back. And, and really not be able to get the best out of that person ever again after that mistake that they have made. It's just, it just makes common sense to me that you do all you can. Uh, and, and, and I would say that a large percentage of the people who have gone to prison are first time offenders, a large percentage. And a large percent of them also have made mistakes that put them in prison. 
I mean, you, you, you get drunk and you, 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 you have an accident and, and you injure, maim, or even take somebody's life, it still was a mistake. And it's wrong and it's as sad as it can be, but you can't charge that person with first degree murder. So they're going to get out. They're going to get out. So what do you do? Because they made that mistake, you may as well just hang them or, 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 or shoot them, you know, or, or just take their life. I mean, because if they're going to end up being um, a burden on society, what have you really done for society in that? In, in that situation. I hate to be so graphic about it, but uh, yeah. Well, I, I think what you're saying is is correct. I mean, what you're talking about is an overall, um, a, a much larger issue. And that is um, how, do, how, do we, uh, how do we bring people back who are coming out of prison back into society as a whole um, and, and make them successful and, um, and Give them opportunities. Make sure they have opportunities, um, because people do make mistakes. I get that. And um, but you know, in this country, one of the one of the greatest things we've got is the ability to vote, and yeah. uh, we have taken that away. And I, I think what also bothers me after this conversation, the conversation we had um, a while back, was um, how difficult it is. Now, obviously, we're going through. Uh, a period where people are there's lots of states that seem to be restricting uh, or making it harder to vote and um, uh, I personally am one of these people that don't like that we this is a this is something that is so important to this country we want people to vote that's what we want you know we just had an election obviously here because you were involved in it where what it was 40,000 people around that that voted for judges and clerk positions and the DA, not a lot of people that vote. No, no. It's hard to get people to come out. Um, yeah. And we, but we want people to vote. We want people to uh, understand what is important and what they're voting for and who these people are that, that are running. Um, uh, uh, Tony Gar had asked a question before he just sent another one through. Uh, this program that you've got in Davidson County, um, it's, uh, I think his question was sort of like, it's not just tied to you. It's a program that goes on even after uh, you leave office. Right. Is that this right? Is, yeah, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is now in our DNA. We're actually, uh, we've created a, uh, we have an employee uh, and, and, and um, it's, kind of, it's kind of tough for, but we have, an, we have a position that deals with uh, voter restoration. I mean, it's it's an all day job now. It's 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 um, it's a full time job. Matter of fact, we have to actually have the compliance office help because it's such a full time job now. Because we get in the word out. At first, I didn't want to want to put the word out because I was afraid that somebody would try to stop us uh, with the mm -hmm. signature and everything but once parts and parole uh, bought into it uh, we were able to move forward same thing happened with the expungements uh, when we increased expungements from 11,000 a year to 36,000 a year we had the TBI and the police department all calling us saying man you, you're slamming us here and my response was then you need to tell the mayor or the state to give you a bigger budget because this is people's rights we're dealing with. And now they beefed up. And, and, and so uh, we might not be getting the laws from the legislature to, to make this easier, but we are finding that the departments within state and local government are, the agencies within uh, the government are uh, really seeing the value in this and, and creating a or, or working with us to create processes that, that, that help people. But the shame is that we're having to do this. And, and you just can't beat up on the counties either because uh, they're in the system that they're in and, and the revenue does drive their ability to pay their people and, and, and to uh, handle their facilities. And it's, the shame of it is that, that uh, 
their budgets are created to do that. You know, we have property taxes. We have other streams of, uh, of revenue that allows us to not have to depend totally on fines and fees in the court system. But unfortunately, in the smaller counties, they, they don't have that a luxury, and it shouldn't be considered a luxury. Well, it was, uh, I think it was, uh, going back to look at the list, it was uh, Kathy Greenberg who said she wanted to make sure she heard this, that any Tennessee citizen uh, can contact your office and receive yep. help, even if they're convicted in another county. Now, the other clerk will have to, you know, be a part yeah, of it. It doesn't matter what county they're convicted in. It, the, the, only, the, only, um, the only catch is that that box number four, yeah. which says where the fines or where the, where the costs paid, that box has to be checked by that county. Okay. So it's, uh, and that's where we lose control of it because they've got to deal with their own county as to whether their fee is gonna be waived or even if they can pay it, they've gotta to go to that county and pay it. But uh, right. box number four, if once the box number four is taken care of, we can do everything else. All right, let me ask you this, because um, uh, we talked about a little bit at the beginning, but a complicated process, you've got a, a much better process. Um, but we're talking about, I mean, there are 95 counties in the state of Tennessee. People, yeah. you know, get out of facilities, get released, and they typically go back to their home county. Um, and then, like you said at the beginning, which is, I mean, right, uh, that is um, that, I mean, people have, a, they're glad to be out, they, they're trying to refigure what's going on. They got a lot of stuff on their minds. And somewhere this, this, the right to, to restore their voting rights may only get brought up when all of a sudden they see there's an election coming up or they know somebody's running or whatever. Um, that's when it, yeah. yeah, that's when it hits. So the question that I would have for not only you as our, our criminal court clerk, but for all the criminal clerks around Davidson County, I mean, around the state, would be, again, the best process, and this helps, uh, hopefully helps people who are listening today. Is there a better process? Is there something we can do better? And I know we can always do better, but in terms of giving people information when they're getting out of the facility, but also, um, I, I mean, I was looking at the Secretary of State's website. Um, how do you make it so that what could be a fairly complicated process is kind of laid out in steps to make it not so complicated because what does worry me and i think that's what you were doing when you came up with a better process is that you got enough stuff on my mind and i look at that and it's like i'm not doing that it's too complicated yeah how do we how do we change it to do more like what you're doing and get information even if it's you know at least the step, so people do know. Well, uh, we, what we do, but again, this state is a county. We, right. our, our, we get our from We have uh, expungement clinics, and and we do voter restoration clinics all over the city. And the agencies within the city know our process, and so they're able to direct people to us, or they do it there at the agencies and bring us the uh, paperwork, they're able to do that too. The problem with the state, the only answer I can give you right now mm -hmm. is that we need to create, we, we, even what we do is a shame. It's not necessary. They ought, to have a, they ought to have a law that says when a person has served their time, and I can see saying if once they're, no, I can't even see that. Once that person has served their time, and you know, certain crimes, you're not gonna be able to do it. You know, murder, rape, there are a lot of, uh, not well, they're, it's a pretty good list of things you can't get your voting rights back if you commit it. But the, the longer list is the ones that can. And to just create a law that says, once you have served your time, then, uh, you you ha you can have your voting rights uh, restored, and we have states that do that. And you know, to try to create anything any less is probably not going to be any better than the process we have. 
And and politically, um, I know we don't get into that with legal women voters, but I mean, in this state, do you see that happening anytime soon? It hadn't happened yet. And, and people have tried to get it changed. Yeah. But it hasn't happened yet. But unfortunately, we are one of those states that um, are very restrictive when it comes to uh, voting, uh, voting or voting rights restoration. Just we just make it hard on on our uh, on our uh, citizens, and and we can all come up with reasons we think why, uh, and they're probably all correct. But it's it's sad, and uh, I'm just probably getting a little um, um, personal here, but uh, that's probably why I'm still here. Uh, doing what I do because I, I thought I was going to retire at one point in my life, but I've hit 70 and I'm still doing it. And one of the reasons I'm still doing it is because I want to make sure that at least in this office, it, it actually continues to be the DNA, but because our, our, um, our, the statute does not require us to do this. It just requires us to check box four like every other clerk's office does and requires us to keep the, um, the records of the court and to collect fines and fees. And, and um, that's all it tells us to do. All the other things that we do, we have the ability to do it, but it's, you know, even with the yeah. expungement, it says you, 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 you will, a uh, person who meets the requirements will they they can and will be able to have their records expunged, but no, there's no statute that says I have to do it or I have to go out there and be um, proactive in it. You know, I know we have we just have a couple of minutes left. I know some of the numbers that were thrown around. Uh, so, how many people have you helped uh, with your process? How many people had their voting rights restored since we switched? Since we we, we could always restore, help restore, but just right. hitting the check. Since we started this in 2019, we have helped restore over 3,000. That's right. The numbers are starting to grow again. We've done 500 since November. Now it picks up around election time, but uh, 500 since November is a pretty, we might end up, this might end up being uh, our biggest year on uh, because we have another election coming you know we got the august and then we got november so uh this could be the the year we hit um large larger numbers yeah and do you, do you know um how many people in tennessee have lost their voting rights i think somebody said that at the beginning i think there are, uh, somebody yeah Carol uh, said like four hundred thousand or something oh, it's, it's 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 amazing i mean it's it's just crazy there was a question that, that you can answer because you it's over 400,000 people. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. It's a very large number. It's, an, <laughs> it's enough to turn an election. It is. And it is. <laughs> and that's what scares some people mm -hmm. because who are the people who can't get the voting rights back? They usually, uh, you know, uh, in, well, anyway. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> So I think 90% of them, yeah. Howard, I think I read 90% of them are black. Yeah. 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 A huge number. So um, yeah. we've got issues that we can begin to work towards solving. And you are obviously making a valiant effort. Jim, Howard, both of you have been wonderful participants in, in this uh, first Friday meeting. And the information that you have shared with us has been invaluable. Um, I, th I think you, I hope you have gotten some people a little riled up and maybe a few people very riled up to see that, that we're a community that can in fact move forward um, in beginning to resolve this. And the league is available, I think, to help in ways that you think would be useful to you. Oh, yeah. Say something. Yeah. Many, many thanks to both of you uh, and we have, heading up the state task force on this is someone who has been on our call throughout. Um, and I, I think she's still on here. Kathy, are you still on? 
It's Kathy Greenberg, uh, who is in yeah. Knoxville. And she Here has been, yeah, you've been involved in this process longer than Howard, I think. Uh, <laughs> Not as long as Nashville, who is really, your league is doing the best work in one-on-one -on -one service to people. Um, and I'm sure that's in large part because of your wonderful uh, criminal court clerk office and what Howard Gentry and his staff are doing. We are working on a survey and there I put into the chat, there's the University of Tennessee Knoxville Legal Clinic is going to have, uh, it's almost finished, an um, interactive website where people can go in and they can, uh, based on when they were convicted and so on, they go to a certain part and, and uh, all through the complicated steps and find out just what applies to them. And then they hope to be able to provide who to contact in each county because you have to go to each county where you've been convicted. So we are right now looking for more people to help with that survey so we can provide this information. And there will be on the listserv next week sent to all members of the league information about an exciting new opportunity to help contract to help us get that done sooner than later. That website will open uh, probably next October of 2022, but very, very, very close to that date. Thanks for and that information. One, one thing I want to say, uh, Kathy, and you, you probably already know this, but um, they could be convicted in three counties, but only one conviction is holding their voting rights. So that's yes, the one. Yes, that, yes. <clears throat> that's the one. one and, if I could ask a quick question, I put it into chat, but it didn't come up. We are finding in our preliminary results from the survey that some counties, whether it be the parole probation officer or or the uh, criminal circuit court clerk will tell us we can only look up information about convictions in our county, while others will look up even outside of the state for convictions. Is there we anything, do. yes, I'm sure you do, but is there anything, any legal uh, reason for why people would do that or they just don't want to have to spend the time to look for they it? They don't have to. I mean, they just, they just don't have to do it. Okay. And so yeah. they don't. Yeah. Can an individual go and get the same information or must it go through a special website only open to attorneys and, and court clerks? The individual can, can get the information. They can get it over the phone. They can call, even if it's a different state, they can call okay. the clerk's office and get their, and get their uh, charges uh, listed, uh, okay. given to them. Thank you. Well, our time is up. Um, Jim, Howard, thank you both so very, very much for enlightening us. This is this has just been a, a delightful hour in a lot of different ways. It's su such an informative hour. Um, and, and I have a final word to everyone. This is my last program. Um, oh. I, I am I am coming to the end of my third year term, and um, Karen Weikert is going to be picking up from here on out. Um, and so I know that we will continue to have good programs, but I have to tell you, the attendance has generally been wonderful. The questions that we have gotten have been always provocative, and I have thoroughly enjoyed my three years of doing this. Have a wonderful day, folks. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.